for being here today for this IDS members seminar. Today we're going to be talking about the work of the African Digital Rights Network and a publication that we released earlier this month called Digital Rights in Closing Civic Space. Um, that was published as a, a collected edition of 10 country reports uh, with a synthesis uh, by way of introduction. So we have with us today on the panel, uh, Juliette Nanfuka, who is a digital rights researcher at CIPESA, which is the Collaboration on International ICT Policy for East and Southern Africa. And Juliet's been a very active member of the network from the beginning, and she's the author of the Ugandan Country Report, and she'll be talking about some of the findings from the Uganda Country Report um, in a few minutes. And we're also fortunate to have with us Professor Tanya Bosch from the University of Cape Town, where she's Assistant Professor of Media Studies. Tanya's uh, a co-investigator on the African Digital Rights Network, and she's the author of the South Africa Country Report, and she'll be speaking about some of the findings from that report a little bit later. As I said, unfortunately, Abra can't be with us. Abra Mohammed Ali is a freelance researcher currently at the in International Organization of Migration. Last year, she was a master's student at IDS. Um, she co-wrote the introduction with me, and she's the author of the Sudan Country Report. Uh, my name is Tony Roberts. I'm a fellow at IDS in the digital and technology team, and I convened the network. I'm the principal investigator, and I wrote the introduction to the report. So I'm going to be speaking to you for about 10 minutes, just providing some background on how we got started with this research, what we've done so far, and what we'd like to do moving forward. And then I'll pass over first to Juliet, then to Tanya, and we should have plenty of time after that for your questions and a, a discussion with you and the two panel members. So this network um, has been brought together with a networking grant from GCRF, from the UKRI, and it's a, a one-year grant to pull together a network um, a network of researchers around the issue of digital rights. And the work that we have been doing and the work that we're looking forward to doing in the, the months ahead builds on some of the work done by existing network members, as well as building on previous work from IDS, um, on citizenship, on the Making All Voices Count research, and especially on the work on closing civic space. And that was my route into this work. So when Naomi Hussain was here, um, she asked me to write the Ethiopia country report for the closing civic space work that she was doing with then DFID and ACT Alliance. And in mapping out the factors contributing to closing civic space in Ethiopia, um, we started to see that sometimes when civic space is closing down in the physical world, offline, that citizens are creative in using digital tools to open online civic space. And, and that was really the spark that led to writing this funding proposal and pulling together this network. And um, the network originally was 20 activists, journalists, researchers, lawyers and policy makers from seven African countries, some of whom had already published research on using digital tools to open online civic space. And currently, nine months later, we're a network of more than 30 members. We're working in more than 10 countries. And as I say, we've just published these 10 country reports. Um, having done that, we've already started writing 10 chapters on digital citizenship. We have two conference tracks approved, one at the upcoming um, 
DSA conference, the Development Studies Association conference, and, and two book proposals submitted to Z. So let me tell you just a bit about the makeup of the network. ARDN, uh, African Digital Rights Network members, are individuals drawn from three types of organization in the main. Digital rights networks, activist organizations, and university researchers. In a, in a way, ADRN is a network of networks um, in that we have, as members of the network, three Pan-African digital rights networks. We also have members drawn from individual activist organizations that may be working in a single country or on a single campaign area. And we have members drawn from universities in Africa and in the UK. The original grant, by the way, the networking grant was to bring together UK researchers with digital rights researchers researchers from African countries. So these aren't all the organizations, they're representative organizations, but I just wanted to give you a feel of the kind of organizations in the network. And what we've been focused on in the first six months and have, and have now published is this collection of country reports, reports from, from these, these 10, 10 countries. countries. I'm just getting, just getting a, a, lot a lot of feedback, feedback now if somebody's turned on their mic. Could you just check your mics are off? Um, so we've been focusing in the, thank you, in the first six months on publishing this 250 page report comprised of 10 country reports, looking at um, the use of digital tools to open online civic space. And, let me just, sorry, let me just stop that flashing. It's getting a bit annoying. Um, what we found, the, the kind of top line findings when you read across the 10 country reports is that we were successful in finding what we expected to find. Lots of examples of the creative use by citizens of digital tools to open online civic space. I think when we set out, or speaking for myself, I, I thought that would be our contribution. I thought we would be able to um, elaborate on the wide range of tools and tactics that citizen-led organizations were using when offline space was closed and to open up new space online. But what I wasn't expecting to find was that there were, we identified many more examples of online civic space being closed down, primarily by governments, um, but also by corporations and by misogynists who are using an even wider range of technology tools, tactics and techniques to close down that civic space. Um, and when you read across the 10 reports, you, you get a sense of this dynamic toing and froing. Uh, openings and closings of civic space using a very wide and growing range of tools and tactics. And of course, the internet was invented for cat videos. Um, and I, th when I read across the report, it reminds me of a, a kind of a game of whack-a-mole that fairground attraction where you have a mallet and you're trying to whack the moles down the holes. It, because it seemed like every time there was a, a new generation of technology tools that citizens used to open online civic space, governments would use a, a range of repressive technologies to close down that civic space. And so you engaged in this this game of whack-a-mole. And that happened first with SMS activism, um, followed by the use of blogging to open online civic space and social media. And, and every time citizens innovate, 
the use of new digital tools, three or four or five different state responses are used to effectively close off that online civic space. And this is a, an ongoing process. People are still using SMS, they're still using blogging, um, but no matter how many new tools are used, um, governments, corporations are endlessly innovative in closing down those civic spaces. So in IDS language, what, we're fi what we found out, of course, is that digital spaces are spaces of power and that that digital whack-a-mole contest is characterized by unequal balances of, of power that, and that, that neither are ultimately successful. So both technologies of citizen agency nor the technologies of state repression are ever completely affected. It's a kind of unruly contestation of that online digital space. However, the technologies of repression are, are much better resourced than the technologies of citizen agency. And the technologies of repression are, are under-researched when compared to the technologies of agency. So there's, there's a, a lot of research, a growing literature on citizen use of technologies for um, opening civic space, but there's much less and much less detailed understanding and literature on this arsenal of tools and tactics being deployed by uh, power hold, the pow powerful groups. And the other kind of top level finding is that we need to do a lot more capacity building because the reports show quite clearly that in each country there's insufficient capacity on the part of activists and um, university researchers and um, legal scholars on who is using which tools and techniques to close down civic space. So there's a great need for further research and the building of capacity on the ground in each country to effectively monitor, analyze and overcome online repression. So I think that's all I wanted to say by way of introduction. I hope I've given you um, an understanding of where we've come from with this research, what's contained in those initial, the preliminary country reports, um, and maybe later we'll talk a bit more about what we want to go on and research in the future. But at this point, I'd like to hand over first to Julia and then to Tanya to give you um, some insight into the reports that they've they've written. So, Julia, if I just unshare my screen, uh, when you're ready, if you could uh, tell us about the Uganda country report, please. You're still muted. It's very typical of me to talk without unmuting. Um, great. Thanks. Thanks for that very insightful um, intro, which pretty much has covered everything that I would have wanted to say. Um, I wonder if I should share my screen. I had, uh, as you were talking, um, I thought of a presentation I did not too long ago, and I thought maybe it might be a good company to to what I'm talking about. Is my screen on your screen? Yes. A full screen without my notes on the side. That's right. OK, and as you're talking well, about. No, I've, sorry, I do see the notes on the side. I can see the other slides that come next. Great. That's uh, it. As uh, as you're talking, you were essentially narrating the case of Uganda and I guess that of many other countries um, with regards to civic space. I'll look at it through the lens of elections which we held here just uh, in January, and a look at um, the report through the lens of closing um, uh, civic spaces in the online arena during times of elections. And this has been something that we really enjoy doing in Uganda. It started as far back as 2011, if not earlier. 
Um, and yes, yeah, so SMS was one of the first areas that we shut down. And this was in the wake of the Arab Spring when there was just a general fear in um, the continent about the various other, that the various other dictators had at the point in time. So it is here that we, cut, we have a very obvious attack to um, civic spaces online in the form of blocking SMSs. Before this, we've been having the usual blockings of uh, media houses, journalists being arrested. That has continued to this day. But um, this SMS block was very direct. It was a very blatant um, attack to citizen organizing, organizing, movement building, and just interacting at that point in time. And it has evolved over time to blocking um, social media, of course, uh, through to GitHub, where coders are trying to, you know, do their work, um, virtual private networks, VPNs that people had started using to overcome um, some of the blocks that they have uh, had to face uh, during times, um, elections. But, um, I mean, some of this only emerged after we had already worked on the report, but we also experienced blocks to spaces like Google, Google Docs, um, which was rather strange. Nonetheless, it, 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 sh it, sh it shut down quite a bit of organizing, quite a bit of work um, in, in, that, in that space. But alongside this, in the case of Uganda, we have also had disruptions to some transactions by uh, mobile money. Mobile money is uh, a primary avenue that our largely informal sector society uses um, for financial exchange. Um, so when that is blocked, you are essentially shutting off people who well, half the time are not even online anyway. They are out in the fields. They are literally hustling to put bread on their table um, and are often so far removed from what is happening that they're just trying to live at that point in time. Yet they often feel the impact hardest when platforms such as mobile money is shut down. Um, yeah, so those are just some of the ways in which we see civic space, civic organization, movement building um, through the lens of digital citizenship interrupted when we have uh, blocks to basic interaction and financial exchanges. But, um, and this is particular to Uganda in that we have seen the use of finance as a very, as an arsenal in addition to so many other, other tools. Um, Finance is being used to to limit interaction, and um, there I point out the introduction of the social media tax. And while it might seem like peanuts to the next person, it's a cost that if you have to pay daily in a country like Uganda, where in light of COVID, the opportunity for access to finance is even much harder than it was previously, it, it amounts up to being a very heavy cost. And uh, this is a fee of about five to 200 Ugandan shillings, which is less than a dollar, but it adds up, um, especially if half of the time there was a research that we did and we found that it was the rural women who were collecting the money to send to their kids in the city to help them pay for their taxes. So those are the, some of the underbellies of digital citizenship that we don't often see. Um, the women who are so far removed some of these arguments, the informal society, the informal sector, when we talk to digital citizenship. But anyway, that, that is um, just some thoughts I wanted to share um, in, in reference to, to what Tony had spoken about in his introduction. But this is where we are, where civic space is framed quite a bit by access to the internet um, and the use of social media, which in the case of Uganda, is a very small population in the greater scheme of things. And yet it is here that we've been seeing a lot happening when it comes to shaping people's perceptions around digital citizenship, active citizenship, and um, you know the whole idea of uh, civic technology and what it can do for the population. Um, so many of the state's actions have resulted in bit of a sense of suspicion being raised on the idea of digital citizenship. Um, so there's a document I've been working on and also in reference to one of the meetings that Tony organized, there seems to have been a performance of citizenship in the lead up to the elections, during the elections and 
then after nothing, you know, there's uh, there was seemingly a drop in engaging on the idea of what it means to be a digital citizen, what it means to campaign for a pol political position or ideal ideology online. Um, that seems to stop when that seems to come to come to a halt when Museveni regained remained in his seat as presidency as the president. So again, it goes back to the idea that if you're the lone voice still campaigning for one thing or the other, you are attracting the attention to you in terms of the surveillance mechanisms, which are often individuals lurking online. Um, you're attracting attention to you in terms of not saying the right, not having the right narrative, which is supposed to be pro as opposed to opposition. Um, you are you're just doing the wrong thing. And that is the idea that has been carried generally with um, the online interactions that we have been uh, studying. And this goes back to the arrest of Bobby Wine, um, the activist Stella Nyanzi, for saying the wrong things or for having unpopular positions um, in the online space. So the, the sense of self-censorship, especially when it comes to political engagement, is very strong and is and remains very highly fueled by actions uh, by the state, such as the arrests that we have seen, the idea that surveillance is overreaching and very underhanded. Um, so yeah, that's that's where we are in, 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 in Uganda at the moment. But I think it's also accompanied with a sense of helplessness. There was somebody who said, I've been a citizen in this country all this time, but it's going to be nowhere. Um, in, we're still the same person 40 years and running and counting still. So I think there's an undercurrent of uh, uh, misbelieving of, or failing belief of the idea of citizenship before even go into the idea of digital citizenship in a country like, like Uganda. So um, yeah, this was just a timeline of what was happening um, during the lead up to the elections does not show the drop off or the sense of um, anxiety that the difference. Uh, sorry, where am I? That was held by the different um, individuals when, when, uh, sorry, before, during, and after the elections. But nonetheless, when we look at it beyond the online space, when we look at issues such as freedom of assembly. Um, access to information, we see that even offline, the ideals are rather, um, well, they're existent, but with very, with very tight reins around them in the lead up, or just generally, actually, um, assemblies have been very, um, people have been very uncertain about them, especially with the COVID in the air. Um, we saw lots of arrests uh, during this time, lots of confusion on the idea of assembly, when it should happen, who should have it, how many people should have it, especially when you were on the perceived wrong side of um, the ruling party. So there was a reduction in the opportunity for freedom of assembly, and it naturally relayed itself um, in digital spaces where we saw an increase in the people who were having a dissenting um, position. We also saw a continued gagging of the media, both online and offline, especially during those opportunities where online was offline assembly was being sought. We saw the media being stopped from attending or from covering such um, activities. Um, but much of this plays out in many other countries, I guess, and it's, it was similar in countries like, um, well, if we look at countries that, that were studied like Zimbabwe, it is something that has happened previously. I think just after Robert Mugabe had passed away, we saw similar dynamics with regards to assembly. Um, we also saw similar, well, I guess in all the countries, there's similarity in, the, in respect to the gagging of the media, um, the blocking of media um, websites. So um, it's almost like many of these tactics are part of the same plot. But what we also see, at least in the case of Uganda, what stood out was we have, we love making noise about the fantastic laws that we're introducing, Access to Information Act, one of the first in Africa, um, Data Protection and Privacy Act, 
um, enacted in December, but we fail to implement these, or we simply have them in place, but do not adhere to the regulations when they happen to be there. Not all laws have regulations yet. And often the biggest contravener of these acts is the state itself. So again, that adds to the uncertainty that citizens have with the whole idea of the role they should or could play with regards to being a citizen in the country, be it online or um, offline. But beyond that, we see that there is still a sense of hope coming through by those in the diaspora, ironically. <laughs> they're not in the country, but they're the ones who, who, who seem to have a much stronger appreciation of it. And we saw that during the elections when we were shut down, first um, social media was, the entire internet was shut down. And while narratives um, stopped coming out of Uganda as a country, we saw people in the diaspora, Ugandans living outside of the um, questioning the idea of citizenship, of elections, of voting, of transparency and accountability, all key pillars of what um, we're trying to attain with an inclusive society. And um, yeah, so that was pretty interesting on our side to, to see. Yeah, so I think I will pause there and hand the floor back to you, Tony. Great, thank you, Julia. There's some really interesting things in there that are, as you were saying, common across other countries, including Zimbabwe, um, and some things that are that are unusual and that we won't find when we talk to Tanya in South Africa, for example. So your your examples about the pricing mechanism that social media tax originated in Uganda. Some other countries are, are toying with the idea. Um, but it, it was a, an innovation of Uganda. Um, but also some of those things are very common. So the, the arrest of people for voicing online is something we found across all 10 country reports, perhaps with the only exception of South Africa. Um, and of course, the increasing use of internet shutdowns is, is a tactic that's common across many of the countries. So um, there'll be time for you to ask questions um, in a second. And if you could just use the raise your hand button, that will help us to moderate your questions or you can enter questions in into the chat. But before we get to the Q&A, I'm first going to hand over the floor to Tanya Bosch and she's going to tell us about um, the South Africa country report. Tanya. Okay, thanks Tony. Um, I must just say at the outset that if you hear a lot of barking on my end, it's my dogs and it means that my son's arrived home from school, which is due to happen in the next 10 minutes while I may still be speaking. So I apologize in advance for that. I won't, I won't put them on the video or any cats for that matter. Um, so thanks Tony and hello everyone. It's really um, great to be here and I look forward to your questions. I don't have any slides Tony and I'm going to keep this really quite brief. So um, I'm going to speak very briefly by way of introduction about the political landscape in South Africa, although I realize many colleagues may be fairly familiar with this. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about access to the internet and the digital divide. Um, I will speak briefly about the civic space landscape in South Africa. Um, a little bit about government, some, some government repressive practices that have served to close civic space, especially during COVID-19. Um, but the real focus of my presentation, I suppose, in the South African context is about the use of social media, which has really served through various hashtag campaigns to open civic space in South Africa. So as you are most, um, all of you are probably no doubt aware, the most defining feature of the South African political landscape is the first democratic elections in 1994, um, which represented um, an opening of the concept of citizenship really in South Africa when black South Africans could vote for the first time. So this was quite representative of the end of a long period of apartheid um, in South Africa. The African National Con Congress, the ANC, which was the former Liberation Party, um, won that election and has continued to dominate the election since. And one of the key critiques of our 
um, uh, political landscape um, seen um, still in some ways as an emerging dem democracy is that we don't have a very strong political um, very strong political opposition. Um, another key feature is that um, many of South African citizens are not seeing the dividends of democracy, um, the things that were promised them by the former Liberation Party when they came to power in 1994. Their slogan was jobs for all, housing for all, um, etc. And we see a real explosion of the civic space landscape in the post-1994 context a large network of citizen associations, NGOs and CBOs, and many of them campaigning precisely around these issues, issues of service delivery, access to running water, in informal settlements, electricity, housing, um, land issues, um, and, and so on. Um, this civic space landscape is also dominated by declining funding. So in the apartheid context, there was lots of international donor funding and the narrative from international donors has really been, well, you're a democracy, um, you've got to sort yourselves out now. So uh, a, a massive issue around funding um, and also low access to digital technology um, in, in many of these civic service, civil service organizations. Um, I'll come back to that in a second, but just to point out, particularly since my focus is around the use of social media to open space, the civic space, um, I want to just say a few things about access to the internet. So um, while the numbers are fairly high for the continent, um, if you look internationally, access to the internet, access to broadband internet is still extremely low, um, very poor infrastructure in terms of broad, broadband telephony. Um, but increasingly, um, I think there's something like 60% internet penetration and much of this or most of this, in fact, is by, via mobile telephony. So there's been a massive explosion across Africa, in fact, but particularly in South Africa, um, people are much more connected uh, or, or are connected to the internet now um, due to the mobile internet. Um, but of course, there's still some issues related to the so-called you know, digital divide with, within the country. So for example, data costs are very high. Um, people can purchase smartphones on, a, on payment plans, um, for example, but accessing data is still high. Um, there was a survey a few years ago, and I'm, I'm not sure how current this is now, but it showed that um, in some communities or among some groups, people spend as much, or if not sometimes more money on data to access the internet than they do on food, on, on groceries. Um, so, so that's still um, quite an issue when you want to talk about uh, issues related to digital citizenship. So I've talked about the civic space landscape, this proliferation of civil society organizations, um, the fact that South Africa uh, has, it has quite progressive policy, which allows for protest, um, for example, but at the same time, we have very much the, the, the closing of civic space with increasing police violence. Um, for example, the Marikana massacre um, that may have made it to the international news media in which 34 minors were killed and, which, and in which the mainstream mass media was actually quite complicit in, in developing um, a particular narrative, you know, negative perceptions around the, the, the protesters. Um, so protest is this democratic right in principle, but we still have a violation of these rights, which often takes place more recently. Um, resurfacing, resurging student protests at Wits University in Johannesburg just a week or two weeks ago when our universities reopened. Um, a, a, a bystander was killed, was shot and killed um, in, in, you know, in, in these protests. So you have this very heavy-handed police violence, really um, a throwback to the kind of apartheid era of very extreme police violence, which makes it very difficult um, for people to protest in in particular ways. So you have the state repression really limiting um, civic space and opportunities for people to, to, to protest. Um, but at the same time, we are seeing a growth in digital citizenship. So increasingly, citizens are using social media to open up civic space. We've had a range of hashtag campaigns. You're probably familiar with campaigns such as Fees Must Fall um, or Zuma Must Fall, in which Citizens, particularly young people, used social media platforms, primarily Facebook and, and Twitter, um, to lobby government and, and to network. You know, so you had the creation of, of these kind of network publics where people that were geographically um, disparate and also um, 
you know, across race and class, um, could use these social media platforms to 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 campaign. Um, and we really, I think, what's probably interesting, and I have, you know, I'll speculate about why we see this, is that we are not really seeing um, government play a key role in terms of trying to shut down this this space. So government has attempted in other ways. During COVID, for example, government has awarded itself new surveillance and policing powers. Um, government um, tried to pass um, the regulation of interception of communications and provision of communication related information act in 2005 that attempted to surveil citizens by intercepting their communications this was challenged uh, by a civic society group in the in the south african high court um you know so you have this growth in in digital citizen citizenship um, and government hasn't, as we see in some of the other country reports, that, um, had internet shutdowns, for example. Um, there hasn't been a, a wide prevalence of sock puppets and botnets on Twitter, for example. Um, there have been some sporadic moments at which this happened. So during the uh, President Zuma presidency, there were some pro-Zuma fake Twitter accounts. But this, is a, this isn't really um, a, a regular occurrence and in any event civil society has very low capacity to kind of monitor this kind of government um, intervention. So I think that perhaps the picture is not completely clear. We need to do more research here to see exactly how government may be intervening in some of these digital platforms and, and spaces. But I think the key issue here is really just that um, many of these hashtag campaigns are very much still um, middle class campaigns, people who have access to data. We have 11 official languages in South Africa. These debates all take place in English um, on social media platforms. It's completely English English dominated. There is the growth of black Twitter in South Africa, but not not used very much for political political debate so much as it is used for conversation around things like the, the Sunday reality tele television shows. Um, so government is not really threatened by this. Um, fees, must, fees must fall, I think, is a anomaly um, to this where we, there was actually some kind of um, result from the hashtag activism, and that is that government imposed a no fee increase. Um, but it, 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 the, you know, these campaigns, I think, while they um, are quite important because they do create these network publics, they do set agendas for the mainstream news media, um, they do um, allow citizens to create their own narratives and in doing so open civic space. They don't represent a real threat um, to government, which is why we haven't had the same kind of heavy handed response um, that we have had in, in, in some of the other African countries where I think these kinds of com campaigns are much more used by um, mass public. Um, they're, they're much more wide, widespread. Um, so really just um, I think that um, the political landscape in South Africa provides positive benefits for digital rights in the form of our rights-based constitution. We have a very strong established culture of civic activism um, and strategic litigation to contest breaches of, of human rights. Um, they, uh, unlike in many countries in the region, South Africa hasn't sought to limit space with laws or regulations, um, internet shutdowns. Um, we haven't had the arrest of citizens, bloggers or journalists for expressing dissenting views online. Uh, but again, again, I think um, the, 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 the other side of that is that you do have a kind of culture, you know, spiral of silence. Um, you know, there is quite a strong, um, you know, the people who, who form, who create these online narratives. It's a small group of people. Um, that post often, um, in other words, it's not the majority of citizens that are participating in these kinds of in these kinds of online spaces and internet smartphone ownership and affordable mobile data are not evenly distributed. Um, so this is a real limitation to to, to do citizenship, um, and it also means, therefore, that the right to online freedom of opinion and expression and to freedom of information um, are also are also unequal. Um, and I think that this will probably shift in the South African context um, as as time goes on. And what's probably of concern is that there's currently a very low level of um, civil society capacity to effectively monitor and counter these measures, um, which could shrink effective civic space or, or curtail um, digital rights. So, Tony, I think I'll just leave it there. I think I'm already a little bit over my 10 minute allocation. Thank you. Great, thank you. So I'm going to start taking 
questions in a moment, so please either raise your hand or type your questions into the chat box. Tanya, that was really interesting, and, and I think it's worth pointing out that South Africa is the exception. Across those 10 country reports, South Africa is the only country where there were no internet shutdowns. South Africa is the only country where people are not being arrested for online speech. Um, so it's good to have that kind of counterpoint for uh, for the range of um, digital rights environments that exist across the countries. Um, but one of the things that was common, I think, and, and certainly common with Uganda was how some of those hashtag campaigns in, in the case of South Africa, the roads must fall, fees must fall, campaigns in Uganda, the free Bobby Wine campaigns were went viral. They went viral within the country and they also went viral internationally. And in both cases, we saw at the importance of diaspora voices in taking what were initially local campaigns, national and then, then international. Um, and that was one of the un unexpected findings across the, the country reports. OK, um, so I know we've got people in the audience who have also been doing research on closing civic space in, in times of COVID. So we may have a discussion around that. Um, but uh, who would like to kick us off with the first questions for Julia or Tanya? Okay, I've got John Gaventa first, and then I think James. Go ahead, John. Thanks so much, Julia and Tanya, and, and Tony, what a great project and, and really, really, really interesting. As Tony just mentioned, I've been part of a team that's been looking at the opening and closing of space under COVID. And I wonder if, um, and we've looked in Mozambique and, <clears throat> and Pakistan and Nigeria as our focus countries, not your focus countries. So I wonder if you could say anything more about how COVID has affected these dynamics that you've talked about. Have has it created more openings? Has civil society used it more to to mobilize and 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 so on? Or has it also created more reason for closing down and surveillance and repression? Thank you. Um, maybe I can speak um, from the South African context. Um, I think more more the latter. Um, so you know, with a with a state of disaster and a national lockdown, um, we you know again had very heavy-handed policing, people being injured and killed in some cases um, by police uh, who were enforcing enforcing the lockdown. Um, you know, the government of South Africa used the national state of disaster to grant itself broad powers to do what it considered necessary to save lives. So powers of surveillance, um, emergency regulations compelled cellular, mobile, mobile cellular providers to disclose the locations of possible contacts who, who might be infected with the coronavirus. Um, there was some contesting of this and some amendments were issued by government, um, but, but really you know, that the government was really using the opportunity to pass regulations, um, you know, that gave them greater powers of, of surveillance of, over citizens um, using co the COVID-19 pandemic as, as a kind of um, excuse, excuse to do so. Um, you know, new powers were extended to the army, for example, that was brought in, in into South Africa um, to to um, enforce the lockdown rules, so wide, wide ranging human rights abuses. Um, social media was used by citizens to to document this. So there was a lot of citizen citizen journalism, um, you know, to, to, to you know to document this kind of um, police brutality. But technology was a major part of South Africa's COVID nineteen strategy. So raising key issues around surveillance and um, surve surveillance of citizens. Um, yeah, so so I think in the COVID-19 context, government sort of had an excuse to increase, you know, to attempt to kind of increase 
policies around surveillance and increase this heavy handed kind of policing and shutting down of protest um, and, and that sort of thing. Thank you. Juliet, do you want to come in on that before I take another question from James? Um, yeah, I, I think in the very similar situation in Uganda, um, only that we had an election to contend with, so it was perfect for the state to use it, um, it, its efforts to limit assembly um, engagement, but to also curtail some of the some freedom of expression online. Um, but maybe not to the extent that Tanzania took it, but we did have some arrests. But we saw COVID being used um, against many opposition um, party actors, even when they were trying to adhere to the standard operating procedures, which half of the time um, the president may not necessarily have been following himself. Um, so that was interesting. We also had issues, concerns around um, uh, data privacy. We had just, um, well, just enacted data privacy law, but the extent to which it would apply when it comes to COVID is proving to be something very different. A few weeks ago, there was arguments around whether one would need to have a national ID in order to access the vaccine. Um, so again, issues around digital citizenship. Many people have failed, been failed by the states to access a, a, a national ID and yet here we have the same state now potentially denying them access to a vaccine. Um, so very, very many arguments um, emerging when it comes to COVID-19. Uh, I've also shared a link to some of the research we did into digital rights. And of course, there you'll see issues around data privacy, surveillance, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly. Those are some of the key themes that we picked up um, when it came to understanding just what the impact of uh, COVID-19, its management that is, would be on um, the human experience in a country like Uganda. Yes, thank you. Very interesting. James, you have a question. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, maybe just while other people are thinking of their questions, uh, I was going to ask quickly to uh, Tanya and Juliet. Um, as digital rights become ever more important on the African continent, I guess my question is, where do you see all this going? What do you see as the future within the, you know, the next kind of five year span? Um, and I guess on top of that, where do you see hope? What do you think are you know, things to be you know, hopeful for, to look forward to, um, you know, in all these uh, digital spaces that you're studying? Big question. <laughs> Uh, really difficult question. Juliet, do you want to give it a stab or do you want me to go first? I, I'll, I'll be thinking out loud. I think you've all experienced my thinking so, out loud today, so I'll just continue with it. Um, I think it's exciting. It's an exciting time for the continent, um, even though we barely have half of the population online. Nonetheless, the future is promising because of the potential what is coming up more recently is, you know, more homegrown ideas, um, so we hope that we shift from being more consumers of content and technologies to only producers, and that will shift some of the arguments, scenarios that we find ourselves in where we may not have as much control, as long as it's not the state <laughs> producing some of these solutions, um, which may have a couple of concerns. Um, I think um, content is going to be, I think that's our biggest weakness as a continent at the moment. Um, we are consuming content that isn't in our language, isn't in our contexts. Um, some of uh, the frameworks guiding internet um, ideologies, uh, content moderation and things like that are framed outside of some of our contexts. And so having some comes to content moderation, content regulation. Um, yeah, so that is where we are. I think if I look at just going back to the content idea, um, there's lots of debate going on on the topic of content moderation, where we saw uh, Donald Trump, an entire head of state, being removed off social media, where we saw an entire platform, Parler, being removed off um, service providers like iOS and Google Apps. 
Um, but in many of those debates, Africa featured nowhere. <laughs> Yet, just as much is happening here, only that we have states deciding what content can be published and who can and be removed on, from being a part of the discourse. We simply arrest them, we make them disappear, um, we silence them, and there is not the conversation happening at the international stage in many aspects. Um, so yeah, we need to understand some of these dynamics better from our perspectives, which is why much more of this research is, is needed. And as Tony had mentioned earlier, we need to understand the technologies of repression, which we are simply taking in from all these other countries, which appear seem to be doing well on their fronts, but we are consuming um, their, te their technologies, are questioning what it means for, for us as African countries or sub-Saharan sub states. Um, yeah, so I think that's that's where we're at. So and one hour. Okay, maybe just briefly to come in and say, I mean, I wouldn't want to be branded as being a techno optimist or what's the term, cyber cyber optimist or techno optimist. Um, but I think um, the growth of this digital citizenship um, is very promising. I think especially in the South African context where we still, we really still see the history of seg segregation, apartheid geography, uh, separated neighborhoods, you know, racially segregated schools, even though, you know, they're not legally you know, public spaces like schools and so on are not legally segregated, but we really have a huge, um, I mean, class and race are, are, are very much conflated in the South African context. Um, so I think that digital space really provides an opportunity for people um, from across the country, across race and class to come together and debate. Um, I, I recently did some research, um, the chapter on race and Twitter in my book, Social Media and Everyday Life in South Africa, um, that showed that despite what one might think, you don't have huge degrees of online incivility. Um, at least this is with a very small sample of tweets. When people talk about race in South Africa, there's, real, there's the potential at least for real dialogue and debate and, and discussion. Um, I also think that you've got in Africa this... Um, we also, there's this global trend to political apathy, and we're seeing this, beginning to see this at least in South Africa as well, especially among youth, um, people of voting age between the age of 18 and 25. Um, I think that social media plays a key role in the formation of what Bennett and Siegelberg talk about, connective action. So people using social media for personal um, storytelling, personal act, act action frames, um, people uniting around issues by which they are personally affected, but which are actually quite political, but not participating in mainstream um, party party politics. Um, and increasingly, you have the formation of these kinds of campaigns like these must fall and roads must fall that have these quite flat leadership structures because social media kind of enables that. Um, so I'm not sure if that's maybe that's too much hope, um, but I think uh, I, I think it's quite positive the growth of this digital citizenship and people having access to um, you know Twitter and Facebook are not the main um, key you know the main vehicles of of these kinds of um, civic protests, but they do just add another tool. They're just an additional tool for people to use that allow them to connect in ways that they wouldn't be able to connect with otherwise, or to convey and share information, um, and and also to um, influence mainstream media. So I think the big role, I mean, often when you talk to civic civic activists or, or political activists, they often say that they use spaces like Twitter as a kind of PR tool. It gets the message out. Um, it gets the attention of mainstream media. So I think there's a lot that is positive. Thanks for the link, Tony. Um, so there, we are starting to get some questions in the chat now. So um, Jackie is asking a question that might open uh, discussion about surveillance technologies more generally. But a question is that in some parts of Asia, there's a tension between economic rights groups wanting um, Facebook, Google and Amazon to build data centers in the country and freedom of expression groups who are concerned that those data centers increase their government's ability to conduct surveillance. Are there similar conversations happening in South Africa or Uganda? Um, not really. So I think, I don't know about U Uganda, Juliet, but in South Africa, we have very little 
um, very little of this kind of conversation, very little focus on people aren't too concerned about their privacy often with these platforms, very little um, understanding or care around issues around, you know, da data and algorithms and, and the political power of these big, corpor big corporations. Um, we had a brief um, kind of panic around WhatsApp when they, in the recent WhatsApp privacy debacle and, you know, a few people in panic went on to Signal or Telegram for a few weeks and everyone's back onto WhatsApp again, you know, so, so very little of these kinds of debates around the, the, the power structure, um, uh, you know, around the ownership of these platforms that, that are being used. I think um, in the case of Uganda and I think a couple of other countries, it's it's been a, a conversation, not so much about the data privacy aspect, but more around um, uh, the taxation, um, where states feel that since businesses have gone online with Facebook, WhatsApp being key drivers of online businesses, um, they feel that they're not reaping the benefits of businesses being conducted online. And so some of these entities should ideally have a uh, presence in the country that they're operating in. So they have a presence in Uganda, you know, for purposes of taxation, or some argument around that. Um, but yeah, that's the best that I have seen, or at least that's the most that I've seen when it comes to that debate. It's interesting, this dynamic between data privacy and uh, freedom of expression. Um, that, that, that's very interesting. I think it's something that we should also look into. Um, maybe people are talking about it, but we haven't picked up on it uh, yet. Um, yeah, so thanks. Thanks for bringing that up, Jackie. So, um, Bat and I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, is, is asking some questions about, you know, how do you make the internet of free space and I, I wanted to use that as an opportunity to come to this issue of of the legal environment because there was only one category that occurred both as a positive tactic in opening civic space and as a negative way of governments closing down civic space and that was the writing of new laws and Judith you've talked about um, the, the positive side of that in Uganda with the government bringing out freedom of information laws. Um, but also the, there are lots of new laws that constrain civic space. And I think you also said that whether or not you have a law is a different issue than whether or not that, that rule is connected in practice. And the you know the Snowden revelations made it quite clear that even in those countries with the very best protective laws, the government, the Secret Service, um, ignores those laws and conducts mass surveillance anyway. So I, I wanted to to ask you what the situation was in the two countries about the legal environment um, and how you see that moving forward. And you'd like to go first? No, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me to my own presentation. Um, yeah, we definitely need more progressive or at least um, uh, better adherence to some of the laws that, that we have. Um, however, often we've seen that the state is both judge and jury. <laughs> um, we do not have, sometimes we'll have consultative processes, as should be the fact including in the multi-stakeholder model of the internet. Um, that has reached decisions more cohesively, um, more collaboratively. However, in recent past, have not seen this happen. Um, COVID-19 also showed just how quickly states are, re uh, uh, are ready to disregard the whole idea of collaborative processing, even though people would appreciate the fact that we need to get through ideas and decisions quickly. Um, yeah, so we, we keep seeing directives passed, um, such as the social media tax, there was no consultation. Um, it was passed and that was it. Um, and ideally, the perfect opportunity to engage with each other, to engage with different stakeholders, the public sector, the private sector, rather, academia, the media, you know, the different players, 
um, on how best this can be approached. There's no guarantee that everybody would say no, definitely not. Um, however, a more informed decision could be reached. We are seeing a bit of conversation around this happen in countries, I think, like Zambia. Um, is it? Sorry, I can't remember. But there's something, there's some consultation happening. And if we do more of that with some of the laws that are being introduced, then just maybe, <laughs> maybe we can have a more inclusive uh, space, a more responsive digital um, citizenship regime in the country. Because right now, what is happening is with every decision of pushing people further and further away from the roles that they could possibly be playing. And we're also using outdated laws, hurriedly enacted laws, to also support <laughs> this further pushing away of civic voice um, from some of the spaces where it's much. Um, yeah, that's, that's the issue that, that I see yeah. with the landscape at the moment. And Tanya, I think you were saying, you know, in South Africa, you have a strong legislative base. I mean, so you've got rights-based constitution and a well-developed um, legal framework. But in your country report, one of the things you mentioned was that the UK and South Africa um, governments were tapping into the fiber optic cable and uh, conducting surveillance that way, despite the laws. Yeah, I think we have a history of, of you know, very strong policy around rights, but this doesn't always, um, you know, isn't always enacted in, in practice. You know, a good example is that we've got one of the most progressive constitutions around same-sex marriage, for example, across the whole of the African continent, but still we have huge um, issues with hom homophobia and corrective rape and violence. Um, you know, against non-binary people, etc. You know, so it's it's you know, and this is no different in in when you know when you talk about digital rights and, and digital citizenship. You know, so I think there's a bit of a disconnect often between policy and, and practice. You know, South Africa has this very progressive policy on a number of things, um, but in practice, this isn't you know always enacted. And and in a way that kind of helps us to draw some conclusions as we've already gone over time um, in terms of what the African Digital Rights Network sets out to do. So we we are, we've just got a small amount of funding to do some work specifically around law. So with the Amidia Network, we're going to be doing a review of the surveillance laws that do exist across the um, continent. But as you're saying, the law on its own is insufficient and um, the, the digital rights network also needs to do work of um, awareness raising so people know what rights they have at least in law um, and building capacity in civil society so that their uh, activists are able to advocate around those issues and try to put in make available in practice what's provided for in law so I think that's a good place to start, uh, to stop, sorry. We're beginning that work on surveillance law with Amidia, and we're also beginning a, a round of uh, country reports or chapters on digital citizenship in a number of areas in the countries that we're, we're working in. So that leaves me to thank our panelists, Tanya Bosch um, from the University of Cape Town and, and Juliet Nanfuka from Cipesa in Kampala for joining us in this discussion and uh, we look forward to learning more um, in maybe six months time when that uh, digital citizenship uh, research is published. Thank you both for being here and thank you everybody for listening to the discussion and being here with us today. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye.